Okay, so uh, welcome to my talk, Solar, Solar Cloud, the State of the Union. Uh, what do I mean by that? I've basically given a solar architecture talk many times now since 2009. I've given various forms of it probably like at least four or five different times. Uh, so this is the first talk where I'm kind of doing uh, what's beyond that, the basic architecture, what we did for the initial 4.0 release, um, kind of what's gone on since then, uh, and what's coming up. Although I am going to cover a little bit of the history first, uh, just to kind of catch people up. Uh, so first, who am I? Uh, my name is Mark Miller. I'm a Lucene Solar committer. Uh, I'm on the Lucene Solar PMC. Uh, PMC is the Project Management Committee. It's basically uh, the people on the PMC for an Apache project have uh, binding votes in terms of doing releases, uh, vetoing code commits, uh, things like that. I uh, started playing with Lucene in 2006. Uh, solar a couple years later. I've been working on them pretty much as my full-time job since then, so pretty much a, a professional Lucene de solar developer at this point, although uh, more recently, much more solar. Um, so, a little overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'll go a little history first. Um, some of what I've talked about in previous talks, but a little more high level. I'm going to talk about some of the features that have been added uh, since 4.0. For some of the solar cloud features, 4.0 was kind of really like a, uh, you know, a 1.0 release. Uh, for other features, they've actually been out for a while in the 3X series, and so they were a little more hardened. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the improvements that have come out since 4, some of the hardening that's happened, uh, go into some of the, the issues I've run into, debugging tests and working on improving the tests and where things still need to be improved. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that are coming. Uh, I'm not really going to be exhaustive in any of this. There's a lot more features that I'm going to mention. I, I highlight some of the ones I'm more interested in or some of the ones that are more interesting to solar cloud. Uh, same with improvements. There's you know, been scads of improvements in all different areas of solar, including solar cloud. I just am going to focus on a few that I like. Um, and then hardening, which I've been spending probably more time than, than anything else on. Um, that's, I'm, I'm just going to kind of go into how I handle some things and, and what I've run into. And then coming, that you know, there's some things that are much further out that I talk less about, and I'll focus on some things that are coming uh, probably in the near term. Okay, so first, history. Um, initially, when solar came out, CNET donated solar to Apache, I think, in uh, 2006. At the time, it was pretty much a one-index, one-process uh, system. Uh, you didn't have multiple collections. You didn't have multiple indexes. Uh, there's something called a solar core that kind of drives everything. Um, its main responsibility was kind of to coordinate index writers and readers at the Lucene level. In the early days of Lucene, you had an index reader for, for querying and reading the index. You had an index writer for writing. And you kind of had to follow these complicated rules to make sure you had the latest view of the index while you were updating the index. Um, and so things like solar kind of handled a lot of those rules for you. Layered on top of that, caching, um, faceting, highlighting, spell checking, and, and, and it was basically, you know, the framework that kind of tied a lot of Lucene features together. Um, pretty quickly, it started to evolve. One of the first things it did towards, um, you know, more distributed things is uh, master-slave replication. Uh, this had been done a lot with Lucene. Uh, Lucene has, has an index structure that's segmented, which is, uh, you know, kind of a, a natural thing when you're, when you're talking about replication. You can do something like an R-sync type thing where you only replicate the uh, segments that have changed. Um, so if you wanted replication for either query throughput or for fault tolerance and redundancy, you could set up these slave systems which would pull the master and um, pull over any segments that have changed. In some cases, like if you've optimized your index or at certain times when you're adding documents and merging goes on, um, all the segments can be kind of merged down to one, and then you've got to replicate the whole index. Uh, but, you know, it was a pretty simple way to, to kind of expand beyond one machine in the early days. It was first uh, pretty much Linux only, done with shell scripts, relied on um, uh, hard linking. But later on, we actually got a, a Java version. Lucene kind of uh, developed to the point where it had, um, you know, a, a system that could kind of mimic... Uh, delete on last close semantics that, that you can do with Linux and that this relied on. Um, you know, that kind of became a feature of Lucene, and now we had a Java version that would work on Windows, too. Um, shortly after that, uh, distributed search was added. Uh, this was, uh, you know, fairly simple for the user. You basically pass a shards param with the URLs of the different solar nodes that you want to search across. It's pretty much up to you to get your index uh, segmented 
and distribute it on those machines. But once you did, it was really simple to just say, you know, search these three URLs or these two are URLs, and you hit one of the nodes, it acts as a scatter gather, um, you know, scatters out all these requests, get back the results, merge them together. Um, so that was uh, a pretty simple way to scale as long as um, you, were, you were distributing uh, updates in a simple way, basically. Um, it also worked with the, the, the master-slave replication, so you could have redundancy, and you could have, uh, you know, uh, distributed search for, for sharding scale. I, I wrote a scaling paper, like, a, uh, years back on kind of how to set this up in a, in a fault-tolerant, scalable manner, and this is pretty much what you used to have to do if you wanted a large cluster. And honestly, it was really a lot of work. It wasn't really near real time. Um, you have to do, uh, set up load balancers, virtual IPs, um, it's, it, it, you could kind of get a solar cloud type thing going, but it was a lot of work and it was hard to scale um, really far. So um, in, uh, I think it was 2009, uh, we got together at an Apache Con in Oakland. It was me, the VP, VP of engineering at LucidWorks, uh, where I used to work, and uh, Yannick Seely. The three of us got together at a table and started kind of planning out what we were going to do for scaling solar in the long term, making things more automatic, having you know real fault tolerance and reliability, um, near real time search, and uh, you know basically uh, moving beyond one machine. It, it, it took a while before we really started to focus on that because really until only you know four or five years ago, uh, most search solutions and still a lot of them today were pretty much uh, could fit on one machine. You know, there's a lot of people with, with only millions of docs, not billions or trillions of docs or, or terabytes of data. There's a lot of people that have, you know, 600 million docs, 40 million docs um, or less, and you can stick that on one machine and, and drive it really fast, and basically you just need a backup with master-slave replication. And so that worked for a really long time. Um, so anyway, it took a while before we really started focusing on, on the distributed side, but 2009, we started planning what we're going to do, and we kind of took things, uh, you know, the easy way. We started tackling the read side first. The read side fault tolerance is, is fairly simple. Um, you know, you, you spread your query across to all the nodes. If one of the nodes doesn't respond, you try one of its replicas instead. Um, so basically, we, we had to choose, okay, how, do, how are we going to coordinate the cluster? How, how is uh, a node that needs to query get to know about all the other nodes? Um, as I said previously, distributed search worked by you giving it a shards parameter that says who the other nodes are. Um, so you either had to supply that on every request, you say what nodes you want to query across, or you had to hard code that into your solar config, and you would tell it what nodes to query across. Um, neither, neither of those solutions are very good for a changing cluster where nodes are kind of coming and going. You want to know, okay, well, what nodes are up now, and if a node comes away or a node comes, uh, you want it to enter the, the nodes that you're searching across. So kind of how do you coordinate that? Uh, we decided to use uh, Apache Zookeeper to do this. Um, it ended up being a fairly good choice. It's, in terms of distributed systems, it's very, very solid. It's been heavily tested, heavily scaled at Yahoo. Um, it, it rarely has issues that we didn't cause ourselves. It's got a, an API that's a little bit um, difficult to do everything right, uh, like a lot of distributed APIs. Um, you know, there was definitely a learning curve and a hardening curve getting all of our Zookeeper code to work really well. But by and large, Zookeeper itself does not fail. And so what Zookeeper is, is it's basically, um, it's kind of like a distributed file system. Uh, so you can create paths and you can put data at those paths as if they're like folders and uh, files under those folders. Uh, kind of the main difference in that abstraction is that a node can both have children and have data at it, so it can kind of be like a file and a folder. Um, but so basically, it's this distributed file system that multiple clients can create paths in and, and read paths from. And so it's kind of a way for many nodes to communicate that way, right? If you create a path and another node sees that path immediately, um, then that's a, a form of communication. You can write data at that node that other nodes can then read. Um, and so there's some other things to kind of make, make that stuff easier, like there's something called a watcher. You can create a watcher on a node, and if the data at that node changes or the children at that node change, then all of the nodes that are watching it are notified and, and they can take action. Um, so we use that mechanism for a few things. One, um, instead of putting configuration files at every machine for Solar to read and figure out how to configure itself, we put those configuration files in Zookeeper. 
Um, so all the nodes, when they start up, you give them the Zookeeper address, they connect, they can pull down one central set of config files, uh, and then you don't have to keep all of those in sync. We also keep the cluster state in Zookeeper. The cluster state is basically the URLs of all the machines in the system, right? Uh, which ones are replicas, which ones are, are, you know, which shard each machine is part of, um, so that you can, you can then look at that cluster state and see, okay, if I want to search across the index, these are the machines I have to hit. You basically have to hit one replica from each shard to cover the whole index. And so you can look at the, the current cluster state and know which machines you have to query. If, if one of those machines fail, you know which, re which machines are replicas of where the failure happened, and you can hit the replica instead. Um, so we basically built all this in. Zookeeper now knows the cluster state. Everybody's kind of watching that cluster state for changes. Zookeeper has another thing called ephemeral nodes. That's basically you can create one of these nodes, and it can, its life cycle can be tied to the client that created it. So if a solar instance creates, um, one of the things it creates is called a live node where it registers, hey, I'm alive and functioning. If that node goes down or that connection to Zookeeper goes down, that node will disappear, um, which is nice. So all the other nodes will know, hey, if any of these guys can't talk to Zookeeper anymore, they leave the cluster state and you can stop querying them, you can stop sending updates to them, et cetera. Um, so that's pretty much it. Zookeeper it handled central configuration, cluster coordination. Uh, all this read stuff, read side stuff was added pretty much years ago now, fairly hardened over time. Um, it works pretty reliably. The big hole was you had to distribute updates yourself. You had to figure out how to partition the data, send it around, deal with failures. This pretty much just handled read side failures. Um, we also added some things like uh, there's Solar J clients in uh, uh, something called the Solar J client in Solar, which is a set of Java APIs for interacting with Solar request handlers and sending updates. We added a new one called Cloud Solar Server they can talk directly to Zookeeper and understand the topology of your cluster, which nodes to search for, for like, um, you know, external load balancing. If you use this cl solar cloud, solar server to query, you're not actually giving it the addresses of, your, of the individual machines. You're giving it the Zookeeper address where it can look up all of the current machines and load balance if those are down. So you no longer have to use an external load balancer. Internally, all internal requests are also load balanced by using Zookeeper. Um, so you have something really highly available on, on the read side. Um, of course, uh, you know, you still had replication um, that, that could work with this. Um, pretty much, you'd, you'd have to set up your own kind of master-slave system, um, which, which is just uh, some kind of simple config, but there was really nothing automatic for you. Um, so now the right side. Uh, This is kind of uh, the harder side. So initially, we talked a lot about it, but we didn't do a lot of work. And we finished the read side, and we almost you know, took a break. I moved on to doing some other things. Um, Yannick moved on to doing some other things. Pretty much the two of us handled a large majority of that work. There's other people that have come through and contributed here and there. Um, you know, definitely, it was, it was a huge collaborative effort. But in terms of day to day, Yannick and I were, were driving most of that stuff. Um, so flash forward a couple years later. Um, things are, are kind of rolling forward on, on Solar 4. Uh, we're still on the Solar 3X line, and a lot of radical changes were coming with Solar 4 because Lucene 4 was kind of this big rewrite. Um, and so we decided Solar 4 was a good time to, to add the, the update side. Um, much harder to do, but, uh, you know, basically we talked a lot about it. In the end, Yannick kind of sketched out some, some of the ideas that he really wanted to go with. Um, yeah, a, a lot of the first decisions were whether we basically do what's called an AP system or a CP system. Um, so that's, that's referring to cap theory, which not to get into it too much, but by and large, most distributed systems fall into AP or CP. And so AP is kind of like Apache Dynamo, where you can have partitions all throughout your cluster. It doesn't matter. Even, you know, one machine can be partitioned from every other machine, and it will still accept writes. Um, it will still accept updates. And basically what it will do is it will wait until those partitions are restored and talk to the other nodes and figure out how it should resolve those co conflicts that may have happened when you know, different partitions were accepting the same update. Um, in some cases, it might have to shove that back to the user to determine which conflict, how to resolve the conflict. In other cases, it might just use timestamps or something. Um, so Apache Cassandra is also of this model. 
you can usually tune things to kind of make one of these systems act like, you know, an AP system act like a CP system, but it's usually uh, not great performance wise, or, and that's not what they're built to do. So our first decision was, okay, do we do something that's like uh, a Dynamo style system that can, that can handle all of these partitions, or do we do more like a CP system, something more like MongoDB, where uh, it's, it's basically you shard things uh, by hashing like document IDs, um, based on the hash, you send it to a different shard, and then you have replicas for each shard. And in the face of like lots of partitions, basically what happens is a lot of nodes become unavailable. Um, uh, so, so that's, CP basically means that you favor consistency over availability, and in a large part that means in the face of partitions, you, uh, you lose the ability to do writes in a lot of cases. Um, so somebody like Amazon who made Dynamo, uh, when you, people are updating their shopping carts, the ability to do writes is very important. Slow writes or failed light writes can be uh, equated to money lost, and so they want to favor writes. Um, basically, what drove the decision for us to actually favor uh, the CP system that we did is that with an AP system, it's extremely hard to do something like um, atomic updates. And atomic updates are, for a NoSQL system, uh, kind of the main way to have any form of transactions. Um, it's kind of a transaction at the document level. And to do that, you really need to be able to say when you send in an update, like, here's a, a version tag or something, and I want this to fail if that version tag is not what I expect to see. Um, and then what you can do is you, you can retry. Um, you know, you, you, re you say, hey, this document changed, you read the latest version, and you do a retry. Doing that in an AB system doesn't really work because you can have all these partitions that are going to have to be resolved later. Um, when you send the document in and you say, hey, this is the, um, you know, this is the version I want to update, uh, the cluster may or have conflicts throughout, and depending on what partition you talk to, it's got to respond right away, but it doesn't really know the real answer of whether that update should succeed or not. Um, so there are kind of workarounds to make that work in an AP system, but by and large, the reason we chose CP was, was a lot to do with um, basically optimistic uh, locking for, for documents and, and giving transaction control. Um, so basically what we did is um, we decided to go with, you shard the system, so these are our, you know, three shards. Each shard has one replica. Um, we use Zookeeper to do a leader election, so there's gonna be one leader for each shard. The leader is gonna be basically the guy who first takes in the documents, and then he's gonna send them to the replicas. Um, Zookeeper allows you to do this really cool little al algorithm for leader election that's very kind of efficient so that if a leader dies, one of the replicas will become the leader. Um, and, and things will move on. So what was the hard part in all of this? Uh, really the recovery situations. What happens when, a when documents are streaming in and a replica goes down and you have to bring that replica back, how does it get back in sync, right? Um, that, in that case, it's actually fairly easy. Um, we wrote basically two recovery modes. The first thing it tries when a replica comes up is it talks to the leader and it tries to do what's called a pure sync. Um, and so each node has a transaction log. It's, uh, do documents are added to the transaction log as they're coming in. Um, when you do a hard commit and those documents are committed to the index, the transaction log can, can be tossed out. But in between those hard commits, you're building up a transaction log in memory. And this pure sync take it, takes advantage of that basically to do a kind of a conf an efficient compare between the replica and the leader. And if they're within about 100 documents, it'll just trade documents and the replica will catch up. Um, in the case that it's behind more than 100 documents, it'll actually do a standard replication that we talked about earlier, where it compares all the segments and, and just copies over the ones that it needs to. Um, so that's pretty much how, how a, a, a replica keeps in sync with the leader when it starts up. That was actually the easy case, but it was actually still pretty hard to get uh, very hardened. There's lots of, of little sneaky bugs that, that can sneak into even a, a simple idea when you're dealing with a distributed system. and. Uh, it took a while to get that hardened, but it's actually fairly solid right now. Um, so the much harder case, and the case that we're still kind of hardening, is when the leader goes down while documents are coming in. So you can imagine if a leader goes down, it may have sent updates to, say you have three replicas for a shard, and documents are coming into the leader. So when a document comes to the leader, the first thing it does is it versions that document, um, basically so that uh, there doesn't have to be a single lock at the leader. Uh, when it sends documents to, repl to replicas, it'll actually uh, very efficiently and concurrently send out the documents that are coming in to replicas in parallel at the same time. And the way that it makes sure that the same updates win on all of the replicas is that it versions them all. And if a replica ends up getting a copy of a document with a lower version than what it already has, it just drops it. 
Um, and that kind of makes sure that you can still be highly concurrent when adding the updates and, and all the replicas will have the same document win on each of them. Um, so what can happen though is a leader can go down when say it's, it's sent one of the documents that it's gotten to two replicas but the third replica has not gotten it yet and the leader goes down and now you've got that update on, on two replicas but not on the other. So how do you handle that? Um, so we added a, another case basically where um, when a new node becomes a leader, it will sync up with all the other nodes. It'll do that piercing thing I talked about with every replica and trade updates if they're off by 100. And if one is off by more than 100, it'll ask it to replicate the full index from itself. And so at the end of that little juggling process, the new leader should have all of the missing updates and, and continue. But that's really hard to get right. Um, so that's pretty much what we had done up to Solar 4. Uh, it wasn't fully hardened yet, it wasn't fully ready. We fixed like a million bugs since then. But that's pretty much, you know, the last, um, Solar 4 came out like last October. You know, the previous three years, that was pretty much what we got done. Um, and since then, uh, even, even initially, there was a lot of hardening. We ended up doing a Solar 4 beta release, a Solar 4 alpha release. Tons and tons of, of Solar Cloud bugs fixed in both of those. Uh, Solar 4 came out and it basically had all of that, that functionality. Um, it worked relatively well, but a lot of people, depending on what they were doing, had problems. There were people that came up and said, hey, I've been running this thing for months and it's been working great. And, and uh, there were other people that said I couldn't even get things going. Um, so initially, um, things not that great. But since then, so since then we've been working on a few things. Um, especially uh, some other people, which has been great. That, all that initial stuff was kind of started by pretty much two and a half guys. Me, me and Yannick did um, the majority of the work. There was a lot of other people that did contribute, but like I said, more in, in scratching their own itches. They, they might have been trying to get something to work for their use case or been working on a project briefly, and they contributed some good stuff. But by and large, the majority of the code was written by, by the two of us. There was another guy named Sammy Siren who did a fair amount of work. Um, so it was, it was two or three guys kind of trying to build this huge distributed system. And that's part of why the, the initial hardening um, took so long. But since then, a lot of other people have joined in. Um, LucidWorks now has a bunch of people uh, pretty much full time on Solar Cloud. And uh, they've managed to add a, a few, few cool features. Um, so one of the ones that was added, custom routing. Uh, the initial implementation that we shipped with 4.0, uh, the, the, sorry. The, the hashing basically um, was, was not pluggable, right? So when you sent in documents, we, had, we did a murmur32 hash on the document ID, which was pretty fast, and that would um, determine which shard to send that, doc, that update to, whether it was a delete or an update. Um, so what was added here is actually the ability to specify a custom routing class in Zookeeper for each collection. You can say, this is the routing class I want to use. So you can use your own impl implementation or one that we built. Um, and, and then this can actually kind of do different things with the hashing. So one of the new implementations uh, that's now the default is called composite ID. And basically what this lets you do is as part of the ID, you can put this prefix um, that's, uh, that you actually pretty much hash on. It's, it's, it's not that simple, it's a little more complicated, but you can consider it that like instead you're hashing on this prefix. So if the prefix is say like a username, um, say you put the prefix mark, um, and then the rest of the, rest of the ID is, is the actual ID for the different documents. Um, then what you can do is you can have everything that, ha that comes in as under mark route to um, the same shard. And if you get, that, that basically lets you do multi-tenancy. So say you have like 100,000 companies that are working with your solar cloud service. Um, one way to kind of have them all work in the sa same solar cloud instance is to create a different collection for all of them. Um, but for 100,000 companies, that's actually not a very scalable option with solar cloud right now. You can't really scale to 100,000 collections. There's people working to make uh, collection scalability better. But right now, if you go beyond probably a few thousand collections, it's not gonna be that great. Um, so another thing you can do is you can put everybody in the same index, one collection, and you can use filters to, uh, to kind of, you know, subdivide down to each individual customer. The problem with that is that, um, you know, a lot of these customers might be very small, some might, might be very big, and every single query is going to hit every single uh, shard and node in your cluster, and it's kind of very efficient, inefficient. Um, and so what, th what this um, composite ID thing will let you do 
is you know, each customer can have an ID that's that prefix that it's actually pretty much gonna base the routing on. And you can you know, uh, basically put every different guy on his own node, and at query time, um, you also pass in that same ID, and queries will only go to the nodes that they need to. Um, and so it's much more efficient. And what that also lets you do beyond multi-tenant is that there's some features like grouping and join that don't really work in a distributed fashion. And so you can take the documents that you're gonna group or join and use the custom routing to make sure they're on the same shard and, and now you can group and join where, where previously you couldn't. Um, another thing that was added, shard splitting. Um, so this is a kind of important feature, but um, you know, uh, um, it's, it's, it's not really as, as good as it sounds, I guess, I would say. But so uh, to scale previously in 4.0 when that first came out, the only option really was to overshard. Uh, you know, and instead of, say you have like 10 boxes, instead of just creating 10 shards or something, maybe you create 100 shards. And those 100 shards will be distributed across the 10 different nodes. And then later on, as you add more boxes, you can start moving some of the replicas. You'll have more than one replica of thing on, on, things on nodes, right? And as you add boxes, you'll move those replicas off, which is basically is, you know, you create, create a new part of the collection on the new node and delete the old one, and, and that's basically a move. Um, so I still recommend you do that. That's pretty much the easiest way to initially scale. Shard more than you want to, and then move things over. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, maybe you didn't pick the right number, you didn't overshard enough, or you've used up even how, how much you've oversharded. And this is another option um, to kind of go to the next level, and that's you can do a split on each of these shards into two and um, kind of scale that way. The downside of it is that generally when you're hashing, um, documents are distributed evenly across all your shards, and so when it's time to split one shard, it's probably time to split all your shards. And um, splitting a shard can be a fairly heavy operation you are basically rehashing all the documents in the index um, because you have to, when you split it, um, you basically have to break it into two hash ranges and take one half and, and put it in one index and the other half and put it in the other. So if you have really large indexes and you're splitting on every node you have, um, that can be a pretty, pretty heavy big operation. Um, so in a lot of cases it might be better to do something like just, you know, a lot of people will, uh, once they've reached the limits of oversharding, just create a new cluster re-index everything and, and all the extra stuff you have to that, a bigger sh cluster with more shards, and then you just swap over to the new cluster and shut the old one down. Um, a lot of cases you have to have more hardware for that or you kind of have to co-locate some of the stuff. Um, but it can be, it can be easier than, than shard splitting. But now you have these three options, which is pretty nice. Uh, there's definitely more to do. There's some kind of warts and, and, and stuff on shard splitting and it's been getting better over time and more efficient. But there's still a fair amount to do. Um, I, I won't get into the details because I don't have a lot of time, but. Uh, the collections API, believe it or not, when Solar Cloud 4.0 came out, there was no collections API. A lot of this was just we didn't have time to get to it. Uh, you basically, to, to make new collections, you created a new Solar Core, uh, either by predefining it in solar.xml or using the Core Admin API, and that implicitly created a collection for you. That has kind of led to a lot of issues and why we can't really make a lot of things as nice as you might expect from a normal database. Um, and so we're kind of working towards something <laughs> more along the lines of what you'd expect if you started up something like MySQL, you know, create database, no uploading config or figuring out config, just create database, here's the name of it, you get some starting settings. Um, and so to get there, what we really need is, is this collections API. Uh, it's, it's been getting better all the time. It has SolarJ support now. Like I said, SolarJ is the Java libraries that you can use to talk to solar. Um, it's, it's been expanding and hardening. There's still a lot more to do. It's not very smart yet. I'd like the collections API to be um, more fault tolerant. You know, if, if you're in the middle of creating a collection and the node that's creating the collection goes down, uh, when things come back up, I'd like it to be able to see, hey, we were halfway through creating a collection. It's partially complete. Let's finish it. Um, currently, there's, there's really no fault tolerance built into it, so it kind of has a long ways to go. Um, but it's, it's, it's something that's been added, and it's a pretty important feature, and, and one that's getting better. Uh, another thing that's been added that's pretty useful, cl uh, collection aliases. This is basically the ability to create like virtual collections that are made up of multiple real physical collections. Um, and this, this lets you do like a lot of things. Um, for one, like I was just talking about one of your options for um, expanding to more shards is basically re-indexing into 
a new collection or a new cluster. You can use collection aliases to kind of do that in the background transparently by having um, you know, all of your user interactions with your collection go through a collection alias. And then say you need to re-index, what you can do is create a new collection, perhaps specifying that it only goes on nodes that are unused by your, your current collection. And you can re-index into a, a, you can create it with more shards than your previous collection, re-index everything into it, and then use this collection alias to atomically swap to the, the you know, the re-indexed collection. Um, the other thing you can do is you can do a lot of stuff with time series data, like logs. Um, you can make your, your actual virtual collection a bunch of physical collections, each physical, physical collection covering a different time series of the data. So, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, cold data isn't accessed as much, like so data logs that are over a month old. You can put those in, in a collection called over a month old, and you can have, uh, you know, data that's from the last day in a collection called last day, and data that's from the last week in a collection called last week. And then you can have like a collection alias that searches over all three of those to cover the whole range. But it can also, if you're only searching over the last day, it can just search over the collection that's for last day. You can have a different alias that only references that one. That means a lot of the, the searches that like may need to be near real time in the last day can go to this much smaller index that can have different settings than the other indexes, maybe the different cache settings. Um, basically, each, each time frame can be tuned for um, for the what, how, you know how much it's going to be accessed, whether it needs near real time. Um, older data won't have the caches blown out because the the one day uh, index is updating so fast. Um, so it's a way to really to really scale time series data um, kind of beyond what you could do with everything in just a single collection. Um, yeah, in the future, I started work on this at one point, but I never finished it. But being able to do aliases by shard would be interesting. If you could do what I was just talking about, but within a single collection. So you could have a collection called logs, but still have all of that kind of uh, cool virtual collection type stuff, which, which you can do with shard aliases. That would be great. So I'm hoping that's coming eventually, but I haven't had time to work on it in a while. HDFS and MapReduce integration. This isn't like a solar cloud feature per se, but it's really um, kind of goes well with solar cloud, and we've worked really hard to make sure it works first class with solar cloud. So this is what I've been spending a lot of time working on for Cloudera now. This has kind of been my job for the last year building this stuff. And with Cloudera Search, which uses solar, we only work with solar cloud. Um, so all this stuff is, is basically um, first class for solar cloud. So I'll talk about it a little. Um, so one of the first things we did is we made it so that solar can run directly on HDFS. Uh, we're definitely not the, the first Apache project to do it. We actually took a bunch of code from Apache Blur um, to do this. They have an HDFS directory implementation that can read and write directly from HDFS that has an off heap block cache to cache HDFS uh, reads. We added actually write caching too, although at the moment that's a little buggy. Um, in the, in the most cases, you actually don't need to use that cache. We actually recommend you run your, your HDFS data nodes co-located with your solar nodes. And what that, do, what that means is that um, when you write to HDFS, uh, always the first write is local. So in the standard case, actually all the data is still local at each solar node. And the only time you actually have to use this HDFS cache is in some sort of disaster scenario where maybe that data node goes down and uh, now the only copies are remote, and so you're reading stuff remotely, and now it'll end up using this cache to make sure things are still fast. Um, so what are the benefits of being able to run solar on HDFS? The biggest benefit really is if you're already running Hadoop in a Hadoop cluster and you're already managing HDFS, now your solar storage is this part of that. Uh, you, you know, generally using something like Cloudera Manager or, or there's some other systems to, to kind of manage things and keep an eye on things and have monitoring and alerts. To be able to just have your solar storage as part of that too is a pretty big deal rather than having to make sure you've allocated the right amount of space on each instance for solar on top of managing HDFS. Um, so solar, both its transaction log and its index files, both uh, on HDFS. No, you, don't, you don't have to have anything on local file system anymore. Logs still go there, but even logs, uh, you can plug in something to put them somewhere else. Um, so like I said, use the HDFS block cache for the worst case scenario. Um, so on top of that, then we also recently added a new module uh, that lets you build indexes with MapReduce. So this is kind of like one of the classic use cases for MapReduce when Google first built it, building indexes and then being able to, you know, just open those indexes on various nodes because they, they just can reference, you know, whatever files they need to in HDFS. 
Um, and it's, it's, it, it's kind of very easy to build the index and then deploy it to a cluster because there's no real copying anything around. You're just specifying different locations in HDFS. Um, so what this MapReduce index building job basically lets you do is say, you know, uh, here's a solar cloud cluster. Here's the Zookeeper address for it. Go and figure out how many shards it is so you know how many shards you have to build. Um, here's uh, suck down the config so that you know uh, what schema to use when you're building the indexes. So everything's kind of automatic. You just point it to a live cluster. It will use however many mappers and reducers you specify in the config to build all these individual um, index shards, write them out to HDFS, and then there's an option called go live where you can basically then just copy those files into a live running cluster using um, the solar merge command. So the solar merge command lets you merge um, an index into an existing running solar index. Normally it only works uh, by merging an index on the local file system in, not a remote index. You have to like copy it over first. But what's cool about running on HDFS is that um, it's a shared file system. So all of a sudden merge now can copy from anywhere. So these MapReduce uh, index building jobs output indexes to HDFS and then we've just passed the, the HDFS location to the merge command and you can merge it into a, a live running solar cluster. So basically as news data is coming in, it can keep hitting the MapReduce indexing job and keep getting appended into your cluster kind of live and atomically for the user, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, deep paging, I won't get into this too much because I only loosely understand the, the technical details. I've been paying attention from a top level. Again, this isn't like a solar cloud specific issue, but goes together really nicely with it. Um, when you're using solar cloud, especially uh, like we do at Cloudera with Hadoop, there's uh, just a lot of benefits to being able to pull back a lot of results from solar. So search generally is kind of geared towards just looking kind of like Google is, looking at the best results, top 10, top 50, top 100. Um, and historically, we've seen in solar have been very inefficient when you want to ask for like, you know, the top 50,000 results, the top million results. Um, because basically, what it does is it sets up these huge queues to collect all the results and requires a lot of memory. And even if you try to page, uh, when you ask for results from solar, you can say, you know, here's where, here's the results I want you to start getting and then get up to this many. Um, when you did that, that was still very efficient. It was basically still doing the query that got all of the results and then just returning the subset that you needed. Uh, so this deep paging, what it does is it, it it provides a, a cursor API where it basically passes you back a cursor string and the, the next cursor string that you need to pass it on your next search to get the next set of results. Um, and it uses this new support in Lucene to do that very efficiently. And what that means is you can do things like export huge result sets by just paging through the results and writing them out, which uh, when you're working with Hadoop is really cool because you can do things like mer you know, export result sets from search and then merge those results into something like a result set from Impala. Um, or, you know, people that are doing analytics um, on, on search data who want to pull back a lot of results and, and, you know, do the analytics over all of them. This is a, a great way to kind of be able to dump things out. Um, I know there's other people working on other ways to efficiently dump uh, large result sets out, um, but this is, this is definitely a, a cool way. Okay, some of the improvements. I gotta speed up here. So some of the improvements that we've done since 4.0, streaming updates rather than batched. Initially, we would batch 10 updates at a time when they came in. Like if you were streaming updates with, with the concurrent solar update server, or if you were using the bulk APIs where you can do like solar server .add docs and you can add like 100 at a time, um, it was actually batching those. And that was pretty slow and inefficient. Now we actually just stream them. Um, this makes, uh, when you're adding one document per request, it's a little less efficient than it was now. But if you're adding, if you're using the bulk APIs or the streaming APIs, it's way, way more efficient. And in fact, if you're both loading, you really want to use them um, because otherwise it's, it's fairly slow. We actually default to, to distributing updates with Java bin, a binary format now, format now rather than XML. This is much, much faster. Parsing, writing and parsing XML is slow. Doing that all in, in Java bin is fast. Um, much, much faster. Uh, cloud Solar Server hashes client side. So Cloud Solar Server, well, it knew where all the shards were and who leaders are and everything when it was sending in updates. It didn't actually know which leader should, which shard should get which update because it couldn't do the hashing. The hashing was done on the solar side. So all it could do is send it to some leader and hope that that leader didn't have to forward it to a different leader, which often it did. So it was kind of inefficient. Things have been changed now so that the cloud solar server knows how to hash. You do have to tell it your ID field. It defaults just to ID. 
Um, if you change that in the schema, then you want to tell it to use a different ID field. But then it, it will hash locally and send all updates to the correct uh, leader, which is much, much more efficient. Um, async collection API requests currently, if you, uh, this is actually going to be new for 4.8, but when you send uh, collection API requests, they're all done serially, um, and creating a collection can be pretty slow. There's no reason to do them serially, so to be able to make it really fast, to create a lot of collections, uh, everything is moving to async where they can run at the same time. Um, SSL support, this was a big one. You couldn't really do Solar Cloud with SSL previously for a variety of reasons. Um, now you can do it. Uh, there's, there's these new properties in Zookeeper, I think in 4.7, and uh, they're called cluster, cluster state properties. Um, you, can, you can look in Zookeeper where you can find them. There's a new collections API to update them. And one of them uh, lets you set the scheme to use. And if you set that scheme to SSL, then you can now actually set system properties to configure all of the HTTP clients used within Solar to use the right certificates and everything so that things run with SSL. Better documentation for that coming, but that all works. Um, hardening, speed up. Lots, lots of additional tests, uh, lots of additional hardening that's happened. Um, there's these things called the chaos monkey tests, which uh, randomly kill servers while adding documents and searching. And at the end of randomly killing and starting all these servers, it does all these checks on all the different shards to make sure they match a control server that it was also doing the same thing to, to make sure that all the shards are consistent. I spent a lot of time fixing issues around this, um, but it's gotten a lot better. There's, there were both bugs in the test and real bugs, and it takes a lot of time to straighten out which is which. Um, hardening with logging, that's cut off there a little. Logging has gotten much, much better than the early days. We have a custom logger now when you run all of the Solar Cloud tests. This custom logger prints out the port for each logging line, the port that, um, for the replica that that logging line came from, the collection, the thread that was used. This basically lets you uh, run through uh, a bunch of logs and know um, exactly you know, which solar node each log line came from, and you can kind of trace the exact steps of how everything happens. Um, this is basically how you track down Cloud Monkey fails and, and debug things. Uh, it's, it's pretty tedious to sit there and look through log files a lot, but um, I found a few ways to make it a little faster. Um, so this is pretty much how I do it. I set up a Jenkins machine that runs all of the solar cloud tests, including the Chaos Monkey tests continuously, and it actually, for every fail, will collect the logs for you and keep them around. So it's really easy to just have this running all the time, look at it at the end of the week, see which one failed, pull out those logs, and then you start dissecting the logs. Um, so how do I dissect the logs? Basically, um, I have this tool called Sublime Text. There's a lot of other text editors like it. It's got a plugin called Filter Lines, and you can basically put in a regex or you know, any, any string and copy only those lines out of the document into a sub, sub document. So if you run all these solar cloud tests and you see that there's a replica out of sync um, and, and you see all the other replicas are in sync, you can, you know, you pull out all the logs, you use this uh, plugin to just put in the port number for that replica that's out of sync. It pulls only the log lines for that node into a sub document, and now you can trace through and basically see all the actions that happened, including the documents that, that went to different places. And it basically lets you just really focus in on individual things. Um, so, yeah, running out of time. So, the Jenkins cluster, basically, um, we run a lot of Jenkins nodes on a lot of different machines where they're running the tests continuously. Uh, this is really cool because um, it basically lets you run on a lot of different OSs, on a lot of different hardware. You run in, you find a lot of timing issues, you find a lot of, uh, um, a lot of bugs that you wouldn't normally find, but it's also been very difficult. Getting tests to pass in all these different environments when they're running continuously and they're randomized and it's different OSs, et cetera. Well, really valuable and has really letting us fix a lot of things. It sucks a lot of time too. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's been great. It's been great to, to, to make everything really hard and to work that way, but it's really sucked a lot of time. A lot of stuff to do. This is like my last slide. Um, a lot more testing to do in general. We need a lot more unit tests. Uh, we've been getting more and more people to help out. So uh, I'm hoping more people start like expanding the unit tests with me. We got a lot of integration tests. We need more of those too, but by and large, we don't have enough unit tests. Um, it makes the bugging take longer, a lot of digging through the logs. Um, we need more testing around the leader failure situation. Um, we, we're, we're doing pretty good in the case where a replica goes down. When a leader goes down, um, while things generally work, there's still holes and there's not enough testing. 
Uh, we need more testing around Zookeeper session expiration. When, when a, a node expi connection to Zookeeper expires, it has to go into this recovery. Um, and that's this kind of whole separate recovery process that's not well tested enough uh, for various reasons. Uh, Chaos Monkey tests need to expand. They need more behaviors, more random behaviors. They need to add documents in different patterns. Um, we need more tests that use like IP tables to simulate hard failures. You can use IP, IP tables to block local ports and, and simulate failures. We have some of those. We don't have enough. Oh, coming. Okay, so stuff that's coming. Big thing that's coming, uh, storing the truth in Zookeeper. Right now, there's a lot of truth on the individual solar nodes because solar XML exists on all those nodes that defines what cores to create. When a core is created, it automatically registers itself in Zookeeper. Um, so collections can kind of come back from the dead, basically. You can delete a collection in Zookeeper, but for some reason the node wasn't up at the time, um, and so it still has the solar core, and so later that node can come back and that collection can come back from the dead. Big thing we're doing is making the truth be Zookeeper so that when that node comes back, it can look at Zookeeper, say, hey, that collection's not around anymore and not let that code, that core come back. This is a big deal. Um, there's a lot more to get into on that that I don't have time for, but making Zookeeper the truth is gonna make things a lot more like you'd expect from a normal distributed database. It's a little funny with Solar Cloud right now. Um, yeah, a little more about Zookeeper the truth. Um, yeah, basically collection attributes like replication can be uh, you define them and the system will keep it. Like when you create a collection and say I want a replication factor of three, when you add new nodes it will kind of, you know, be able to expand uh, that collection to match what you defined rather than right now where, um, you know, there's, there's nothing, if, if things change over time, there's, there's no corrective process at the moment. Um, yeah, I've run out of time so I'll skip that. Uh, more stuff we need around testing and it's probably coming. Uh, in the beginning, we avoided a lot of mocking because the APIs were changing so fast and it's really hard to update uh, all your mock classes all the time to keep up. So uh, basically, uh, there, there was not a lot of mocking that's been done. Now that there's been a lot of hardening and those APIs are a lot firmer, we need to make a lot more of those classes mocked in a way that a lot of new unit tests can take advantage of them and we can stop having so many integration tests. Um, Chaos Monkey needs more behaviors, like I said, in simulations. Um, testing the test. There's, we've had a lot of cases where like th there was three months once where the chaos monkey wasn't actually killing any instances. Um, so it wasn't really testing anything or at least any failure case scenarios. Um, we, need to, we need to figure out how to make sure our tests are actually testing what we expect. Uh, there's only so much you can do on that, but um, it's not good when three months go by and, and a major test is not really working. Um, other stuff is coming, reliability and stability, scaling, scaling, scaling. There's a lot of huge companies now really pounding on this thing. Reliability's been getting a lot better. Multi-data center options, right now your options are very limited. Um, there's, I know there's a couple companies that are gonna be putting some resources towards that. Um, collection templates, don't have time to get out of it, pretty much out of time here. Uh, the end, my social media information is, is there. Um, yeah, I say we have like a minute for questions, so. Anybody? Yes, we have one minute for a question. Please raise your hand if you have one. No? All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.